Okay, welcome back for the second half of CEE 120B, 220B session seven. Um, the recording got cut off a little bit at the end of the first part of the session, so we're actually re-recording the second part of the session. Hopefully this will match up what went on in class and be useful to everyone who's watching online. So where we had left off, we were talking about oh, the whole issue of adding windows to the exterior of the building to go ahead and try and increase the daylighting in different ways we might approach doing that. There are a lot of different approaches. We would look at, oh, for example, the Y2E2 building sort of having, oh, well, let's go back out to it again. Y2E2 exterior images like pairs of windows, kind of a very common strategy of bringing the windows together is rather than just going through and putting a bunch of individual punched windows, pairing them up because that kind of creates a nice architectural rhythm which is uh, kind of pleasing to the eye and kind of gives an order to the overall quads. So that's one way of doing it. There's a lot of other ways of doing things. As we were looking at the Y2E2 building, other things we noticed is that there are some areas that have a lot of glazing, some curtain walls, and these typically are associated with public spaces, spaces where you need less privacy and you want to sort of uh, invite people in, just kind of uh, indicate that you want to bring people into that space. That glazing typically sort of indicates that. So super. There's a lot of different sort of interesting things to look at in these images. Oh, even this is kind of an interesting image. You sort of see here how in our public spaces in the um, atriums that bring light down from the roof into the center of the building, again, we have a lot of open glazing on the inside of the building um, in the conference rooms, in the project rooms, just bringing that light into the interior spaces and allowing them to be daylit as opposed to uh, be using a lot of uh, artificial lighting. So another view of the interior atriums. Just overall, that strategy works out very, very well for us here in the Y2E2 building. Okay, let's go ahead and actually return to our little sample building. Our sample building actually did return some results, and let me show you how we can look at them and just sort of make some sense, use it to guide us about really what we want to do next. Um, when the lighting tool returns, um, it'll pop up a little dialogue. Unfortunately, I didn't capture that on the video in the remake here. But what we'll do is under lighting, choose the lighting choice. And what that'll do is basically import the lighting from the cloud to our Revit model. Okay, and when it does that, a couple different things appear. Um, two of the different things that appear are in the 3D views, you get this thing called the lighting analysis model view. Okay. If you take a look at that, that looks like the 3D view, but it actually has the ability to go through and set some rendering settings which are, which are useful for um, either controlling the daylighting or, well, they're going to learn even to go ahead and start thinking about electrical lighting that might be provided in there. Okay. We also have a lighting analysis level one plan. This is the view a lot of people will look at. Think of it as a big color map which is showing the lighting levels um, in the uh, building at this time. You can see right now it's displaying in Lux and it's at 3 p.m., so 9.16 at 3 p.m. The way to sort of look at this relative to the lead criteria is we were always looking for 300 to 3,000 as being a good valid range. So in general, what we're going to be looking for, if you look at the scale over here, is the blues and the greens. Those are the areas that are sort of considered to be really good in terms of being within the desirable lead daylighting levels. Things down in the red zone, kind of up in here, don't have enough daylight right now. Things in the yellow zone are actually a little bit above the threshold. Okay, so you can sort of have problems on both ends, needing more daylighting as well as maybe needing to filter out some of the daylighting. So you can look at it this way. This is kind of an interesting way to kind of really quickly understand what parts need some more windows. So looking at this, I could think about on this front wall or even above adding some more daylighting features to kind of fill in and have less of that red zone. Another way to look at this is there's actually a room schedule which is produced and that'll show you a little more numerically what's going on. You'll see that for that one big room of 500 or 5,930 square feet, about at 9 in the morning, about 47 is within threshold, 47%, 7% is above threshold, 47% is below threshold. Okay, at 3 in the afternoon, which is what we're looking at right now in the graph, it's 47 is within threshold, 14 is above, and 39 is below. And if we look back there, you might sort of see this big red zone is the 39% that is below, that's the 14 that's above, and I think we're trying to get 80% within the threshold. Okay, so we have a little work to do to make this happen, but that's okay, we're ready for it. 
Okay, we sort of know where we need to go through and add some more things in here. Now, this view is actually very, oh, what I call it, very graphical, very intuitive about what's going on. There's another way of presenting it, though, that could give you a little more hard numeric data if you really need to understand what those values are numerically. And let's kind of take a look at a couple things you can do. One is, right now, these settings are presented in Lux, Lux being a system which is, you know, appropriate for, well, it's kind of the way we often measure things now. It's more using the international system of measurements. Okay, if you want to change that to be foot candles instead, okay, we could go through and change from Lux to foot candles. Okay, it'll just rescale everything. Now it goes up to about 557. Think approximately of a factor of about 10 between foot candles and Lux. Not exactly precisely, but sort of in that range. Okay, maybe a little bit lower, nine and a half or something. Okay, so that could help there. The other thing we might want to do is actually display some numeric values on the grids, and here's how we can do that. This data is presented right now using a style, and there's actually basically a default analysis display style associated with this plan. So you can change that if you like, and here's how you can change that. If you choose that style, it's actually a menu that you can choose, and if you click on the dot, 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 you'll see there's several different styles that are available to you. Okay, so this is the lead version four, option two result style. You can show it with points, which some people prefer. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, which shows it as a series of points as opposed to a continuous color map. But what you may want to go even further in doing is actually show the data values on there. We'll put some annotations on there. So style points with annotations, that'll put some numbers on there. Okay, so we have the numbers on there. This is actually giving us the numeric values right on the points. You'll see it's going everywhere from 557 foot candles over here in the corner all the way down to just seven foot candles. So very, very dim, kind of over in this range, about 557 here, going back to 47 in the corner. Again, we're trying for this range that's between three to 3,000. Let me change that back to Lux, just so we can sort of see it that way. Okay, and we see we go everywhere from 6,000 to 1,000 to 6,000 down there. Now, the text on the screen you're looking at may not sort of be appearing quite so good. The text is a certain size. It's currently set to be a quarter inch relative to the scale that's plotted. So if your text doesn't look appropriate, you might need to go through, or it's big, it's obscuring the points. Just change it to a different scale. So you'll see if I have a quarter scale, the text is smaller relative to uh, the size. If I was looking at, at like 16 scale, something like that, kind of a smaller scale, you'll see the text is inordinately large. So if you're having trouble reading your text, you can do a couple of different things. One is just go through and change the scale to kind of make the scale appropriate for what you're looking at. The other thing you can do though is if you want to, you can choose the size over here and there's different sizes. Right now it's a quarter inch aerial. If you want it to be a little bit smaller, you can change it to a smaller size, or you might even define a new size. I defined a very small size, like 1 64th inch aerial, which is teeny tiny. Okay, but that would be appropriate for a smaller scale drawing. So if I wanted to bring it down to 8 scale, or oh, let's try like 1 in 10 or 1 in 20. That's still a little bit large, but the data values are there, sort of much smaller. But let me go ahead and change that back to quarter scale. I think that was actually the best way to look at it. So quarter scale, and I'll change the text size of the quarter inch aerial. Okay, so here we are, we got those data values. So here's our task. We're trying to get those points to be somewhere between 300 and 3,000 to meet the lead daylighting criteria. We, uh, just in terms of general um, comfort in the space, might want a different kind of range of values. Again, how we can get that is, though there was the handout out in session seven of lighting level recommendations. So if this is general office space, 
and I was thinking about it in terms of Lux. Oh, I might be going 200 to 500, something like that. Again, if you go down this chart, you can find office spaces, which are down in here. Offices, kind of, oh, just general, like workspaces, general and privacy reading. Accounting, offsetting and duplicating, lobbies are C, mail sorting, here's reading. So reading, electronic data processing tasks, I'm going to be working on some, actually we don't work on CRT screens anymore, we tend to work more on LCD screens, this needs to be updated a little bit. But I'm going to shoot for, oh, kind of like the C to D range, let's say 100 to 200 lux, now well, maybe 200 to 500, which is 20 to 50 foot candles. Okay. So I will go back over to my Revit model and sort of say, hmm, looking pretty good, a little bit too bright over here, a little bit too light over there, or too dark over there. Let's go ahead and think about how we can change these things. So go back out to my 3D model. Okay, the idea is when we want to start making changes, there's a lot of things we can do. We could add windows to the side, we could add windows to our skylights to the top, we can really come up with any number of strategies. So let's talk about a couple ways you can add uh, kind of lighting to the sides and then some to the top, and then we'll kind of try and do some reanalysis. Now, to get yourself going in terms of thinking about different ways, we actually put together a lot of examples of different uh, kind of daylighting sort of approaches as Revit models that you can take a look at. Uh, on the coursework side, as well as on Mimtopia, you're going to find basically a whole lot of different sort of views. Everything from this typical view with no to windows, um, just windows with deep overhangs, clear story windows, those higher vision windows, curtain walls, curtain walls with light shelves, skylights, a shed skylight. It's a lot of variations, and we'll go through and revisit this next time too. But there's a lot of examples for you to draw from. So for example, oh, if you were interested in doing some clear story windows, you could take a look at the example that's out there. Okay, or we can just go ahead and implement it in our model. But I put those out there just to sort of illustrate to people how you can go through and uh, create some different daylighting conditions. I'm gonna put in some windows. Oh, I definitely need them on this side somewhere. So I'll go through and put some windows in here. Now, as I'm putting them in there in 3D, Okay, you'll notice that I'm not getting very good control over the heights of those windows. Let me go ahead and grab them individually and just go through and adjust their heights. Okay, for their head height, I'm going to make it all 7 feet. Okay, make it uniform. Now, if I want to go through and put some little uh, clear story windows again in there just to add some daylighting, but also have some privacy, what I can do is I will do this little 36 by 24 window. I'll put it right on top. Oops, didn't do a very good job there. Maybe it would be better to go through and put these in in the elevation view because I can sort of see a little bit better what's going on. I'll put that in there. And super, maybe I'll copy them across. A good way to approach this actually, let me comment on that, would be Rather than putting them all individually, let me try this, just as a kind of window placement strategy to give you some guidance, would be to grab those two windows. Let me grab this lower window and this upper window. Okay. And I could go through and make them a group. The advantage of being a group is that window with clear story. Um, basically, they're all going to be clones of each other. So if I go through and make a change to my group, it'll affect all the instances. So I can start putting in groups, copies of the group. Maybe I'll pair them up. Okay, right next door. That looks pretty good. Again, the advantage of the group is you can edit the group and if I decide to change that, oh, as opposed to being 36 by 24, I want to duplicate that and say there's a 36 by 18 window, or 30. Let's try that. Make it a little bit taller. I'll make that 2 foot 6 tall. So I've put it in in the 1, but as soon as I finish the group, OK, 
Okay, it'll clone it to all of them. So that's kind of a, just a nice way of uh, having repeatability as you go through and do this, as opposed to having to manipulate them all independently. So great. I got some nice new windows that are kind of hanging around there. That's looking good. Maybe I should add some skylights into this too. Now skylights are typically a window component. If you load, you can load some individual skylights. There's my skylight part. They place like windows, but in roof surfaces. So I can kind of have small skylights. I could have large skylights. Now let's put some skylights in here. Now realize, as I'm making this change to the model, I'm actually invalidating the lighting model. The lighting model is going to have to change again. So just be aware of that. You want to make sure that your lighting model is in sync or that you're not working with an old lighting model relative to your changes. You have to run it again. So that'll work okay. Let me show you one other skylighting strategy just so you have it in your uh, bag of tricks. If I go back out to um, winter and I go to those daylighting sample buildings, one type of skylight that um, some people, especially around here at Stanford, might be interested in is the shed skylight. Let me open that up. We have shed skylights on the Y2E2 building here. That's why it's so interesting uh, just to kind of think about as an example, because we sort of live with them all the day, every day, and they're very effective for bringing light in. This is again in those sample buildings, so you can open these up and sort of see how we've modeled them. They look something like this. And really what's going on is I have a series of curtain walls around the edges. This thing on the top is actually called sloped glazing. Okay, so it's one of the roof categories. When you say roof, and you make a roof footprint roof, you can choose from the basic roof types for sloped glazing. Now, that looks like just a big old plain sheet of glass just to sort of uh, make it a little more realistic. Let me edit it. I'll put some uh, grid lines in it. Chances are your slope glazing will have a little more of oh, some mullions in it. Okay, and some sort of a grid pattern. Oops. Looks like I only put that on the border. Let me always put that in the middle too. That's the interiors. I'll put it on the other border also. There we go. So that's a little more like it in terms of uh, shed skylight. So we could put some of those in there too, just really whatever is gonna be most useful to you. But let's go ahead and take a look back at this building. Okay, so I'm adding windows in there. That's actually looking pretty good. On the other hand though, I may want to, let's see if we can refresh that. Go ahead and take care of this lower corner. You'll see all those values of 6,000. So we're actually above the threshold, more at three in the afternoon, because you can sort of picture the western sun coming in. But we have a little bit too much light over there, and let's talk about how we can cut that out. So if I go back over to my 3D view, you'll see we have a couple of different approaches we might use. One approach for cutting out on this amount of sun coming in is to just change the overhang of the roof. So right now there's a very minimal overhang. If I edit its footprint, hang on, Let's see what am I doing here? Looks like I'm creating a new roof. I'll choose that, say edit the footprint. There we go. There's the pink line that defines its edge. I can pull this out and we can actually figure out the how far we would need to pull this out based on the sun and the sky and really the angle it's kind of bearing on down with uh, during the summertime. Typically in the wintertime we actually sort of like that light. But we'll pull that out to kind of shade those windows. That's one way to approach it. So I can do it with roof overhangs. It tends to be very effective, but it actually sort of overhangs and sort of highlights, hides everything. Yeah, might be an effective strategy, especially if I want to put a doorway back in here and I want to have it protected. So, oh, in the scheme that I was actually going to go through and put a door in, somewhere back in there. Okay, that overhang might be very useful to me to kind of keep the rain off our heads. Okay, 
The other way of approaching it, though, that I want to make you aware of is something that we do an awful lot in buildings today, and that's to actually work with a curtain wall itself. And so let's take a look at the curtain wall and see what we have to work with. In the curtain wall, we have all these mullion pieces, and typically the mullion is this very small little 2.5 by 5 inch rectangular piece of aluminum. Okay, And that's not providing much shading for us. But if I would like it to provide a little bit of shading, picture, if you will, a mullion which is a little bit deeper. So it's still two and a half inches tall, but what if that was a foot or 18 inches or 24 inches deep? And how effective that could be as a shading mechanism. And that's actually a strategy we use a lot now. So in a lot of modern buildings, when you look at the curtain wall facades, you'll find all these shelves or pieces of metal that stick out as light shelves that either shade the light or actually help reflect the light back up towards the ceiling. But it's a very effective strategy. And how you can model something like that in Revit looks something like this. This is currently pinned. That's because um, it's part of a pattern. I'll unpin it and I'll say, Here's this two and a half by five inch rectangular mullion, that's okay. But what if we wanted to go through and duplicate that and create a 2.5 inch by 18 inch kind of rectangular mullion instead? Okay, good thing about Revit is everything uh, in terms of how these forms are defined is just a profile that's extruded. So I can say okay and say it's still two and a half. That's the uh, inch and a quarter, inch and a quarter. I'll make that 18. Say OK and change that one mullion to 18 inches. Now you're looking at that mullion and it's actually doing pretty good for what we wanted but not exactly what we had in mind. And the reason is as it defined itself it really sort of put part of it on the inside and part of it on the outside. Okay, and that's what we don't want exactly. I really was thinking about a mullion that would go all the way to the outside. And to look at that, we can see one of the other parameters that's available is this offset. Now the offset is to the center of this rectangular profile. So if I want to have it stick all the way out 18 inches, what I'm going to do is say where is the center of that, and that would actually be 9 inches away. So now that will pull it all the way out. Okay, so I have the total depth, the offsets to halfway. Again, if I wanted to be partially in, I could sort of enter a smaller offset. I could change the depth of the profile, but this will make it all the way out. Now the profiles are also kind of pivotable, so if you want to sort of play around with a 30 degree sort of rotation angle, that's rotating it up, or minus 15 degrees, that's rotating it down. Or we can just leave it at zero if we want it to be perfectly horizontal. Now this mullion is actually one of the categories that is understood by the energy and lighting analysis tools as being something that casts shade. So there aren't that many things that cast shade. Someone asked in class about trees and whether they would cast shade. And sadly, the plantings category isn't set up right now or the, I should take it the other way, the analysis tools aren't set up so they pick up the plantings category. So we would actually have to simulate a tree using either a wall, a roof, or a mullion. Those are the big things that typically cast shade. So this mullion actually will be kind of thought of as something that casts shade. So we can put it in there and that'll be considered as part of the lighting analysis. Same thing over here. I can knock that one, open that up, make it 18 inches, and kind of put a mullion over there, or a light shelf over there. Now, this whole process of selectively going through and changing one mullion at a time could be very effective if you really are trying to kind of have a lot of individual control over a very specific condition. But if, on the other hand, you were thinking about just really trying to change that entire wall so I don't have a roof overhang, but I could have mullions all over it, or shelves all over the mullion locations. What I can do is actually just choose that wall type and let me duplicate it. I'm going to change its pattern. So it's going to be storefront with light shelves. And then what I'll do is for the mullion type right there, the horizontal interior mullion, I'll change that and say, hey, you are going to be those light shelves. 
So we have a single row of light shelves. Now, if you look at a lot of modern buildings, you'll see horizontal light shelves built right into the panel system. That's actually a very effective strategy. Good way to get them mounted in there, and they cast a lot of shade. But if you would like to think about kind of casting even more shade, we have a couple of other different things you could try. You could go ahead and on that mullion, change it so that the depth is greater. If you make the depth greater, it'll cast more shade, so more of the window will be covered. And that's kind of one strategy you can go for. But another strategy which is used an awful lot these days is to think about actually having multiple kind of mullions or multiple light shelves. That way you can sort of cast the same amount of shade, but the individual shades don't have to be as long. Let me show you what I mean. So here's a single 18 inch shelf. If I actually change the spacing, so as opposed to every eight feet, it's every four feet. You see now we have those shelves, we're really casting twice as much shade and depending upon how the sun is hitting the building, okay, that could actually do a lot of good in terms of basically keeping sun out of that face. Similarly, I can grab that face again and even go through and change it to two feet. And again, the precise distance that makes the most sense versus the depth of the shelves, that's really going to depend on the sun and your location, you know, the latitude of the sun and the sky, and just really how much sun you want, whether you want the sun or you're trying to shade from it. But that's an effective strategy for shading. So think about this whole notion of the big roof overhang versus the shading on the individual mullions. Two very, you know, kind of interesting and kind of, you know, nice ways of going through and kind of creating uh, shading for the building. So those are both sort of valid. Okay. Let me give you one ever last variation on it, then we'll wrap up for today. And that is to go through and think about you could go ahead and actually create something like this, this kind of mullion sort of wall, as what is known as a brise soleil, or really it's just sunscreen, and have it stand independent of the building. So, for example, I could come over. I'm going to go through and create a wall. It's going to be my storefront with light shelves. I'm just going to put it in front of the building over here. Take a look at it in 3D. It's actually looking not too awfully bad right now. Here it is, it's kind of hanging around as an independent element. Let me kind of shade that so you can sort of see it. So you can sort of see the glasses in there. Okay. If I wanted to make this more of the Brie Soleil sort of a kind of independent standing screen, I can go through and let me duplicate this. I'll call it Brie Soleil. Sounds very lyrical. Maybe for this one on the horizontals, I won't go ahead and have the border. Oh, I gotta always remember which one's which. Nah, I'm just gonna leave the borders in there. That'll be easier for right now. I have to worry about which one's which. Um, although, well, I could take them off on the top. But let's talk about this whole issue of the glazing. You might say, hey, I don't want glass out there. I really just want this kind of nice screen that vines can grow up and it's going to provide some shading. And if you want something like that, what we need to do is just change the curtain panel type from system panel glazed to none. Okay, let's try that out. Oh, did I get it? It looks like it's still there. Hang on. I think I am choosing the wrong one. I'm always sort of uh, getting this off by just a hair. There's a choice in here somewhere where it's really that you want it to be system panel empty. Let's see if I can find that. Solid. There it is. Empty system panel. I'm sorry. None still sort of put something in there. Okay. Now there's no panels in there. So now we have something that looks more like a light screen. The nice thing about these light screens is right now you can sort of see that's really um, kind of what is it? It's following the shape of the building precisely, but it doesn't have to. I could go through and imagine, if you will, something a little more fluid. Let's go ahead and grab that wall. Cancel out of that. I'll just close it up for right now. 
Oh, I'm just going to draw some sort of nice archy wall. I'll go here to here with an arc out that way. Then I'll come here to here with an arc out that way. So what I'm doing is actually creating, it's almost like a nice architectural feature. Kind of floating around out there. Let's change that type. I don't think I am set to my bricelet either that or it looks like I'm not. There we go. So, you know, this whole idea of providing lighting through these screening elements is really pretty good. Okay. Once you have sort of readjusted your uh, lighting uh, strategy in terms of the windows, the skylights, maybe some shades that you want to add in there, you're ready to run your lighting analysis again. So you can say Analyze. Come on over to the Lighting tool, and you'll need to say New again. This will invalidate the old one, but we can run it again, choosing again the levels that you want. I'll just do it on level one. Okay. And again, running the same sort of analysis. Okay, so we could do that, send it off, and we get a revised analysis. Now, let me go through one last thing we covered in class, and that is the whole notion that you might actually want to use this same sort of technology to consider actual electrical lighting as opposed to just the natural daylighting. And I'll just sort of preview this. We'll visit this much later when we actually talk about electrical lighting systems and how we calculate them. But if we want to use the same technology, it uses a very kind of slight variation, hardly any change at all. What I'll do is I'm going to go through and put a ceiling in my building just so I have some place to put the lights. I'll say automatic ceiling. I'll put it at nine feet above the floor. Just so I have a nice ceiling. Now, realize that ceiling is going to block the skylights, so I need to adjust that. But we'll get to that. We'll say insert, and I'm going to load in a lighting fixture family. For this analysis, they have architectural versions and MEP versions. Choose the MEP versions because they have more accurate lighting values for what we need to do. And I'm going to choose a nice little oh, linear lamp, a little uh, pendant light that hangs from the ceilings with two lamps. You see these in an awful lot of classrooms. I'm going to say let's go through and place those components. And I'm going to place them on the face of the ceiling. So I can paste, place one here. I'll place one over here. I'll do a few rows away. So I'm just having fun laying out lights on the ceiling. OK, the idea is we can go through and do the same sorts of calculations. Okay, using these electrical lights, and you figure out how the electrical lights are either replacing daylighting at night or supplementing daylighting during the midday. Okay, that wouldn't count for lead accreditation, but it would count for just providing light in the interior portions of our building where we couldn't get daylighting. And to consider and analyze that kind of lighting, it's a very slight variation. What you do is you go back to that lighting analysis model view. Okay, this is the place where you can set up the rendering settings. And I go here just because I need to sort of say that I need to consider those lights. So I'll go to Rendering Settings. And you'll see that we have a choice of, are we looking at an interior and looking at the sun only? Are we looking at an interior with the sun and the artificial? Or are we looking at the interior with the artificial only? So you choose, really, which of those sort of match what you're trying to model. Sun only was what we did for daylighting. Sun and artificial would be considering those artificial lights supplementing it, so it'll invalidate the daylighting analysis from a lead standpoint, but it's still useful for figuring the values. Artificial would be only the artificial lights, so that's good for figuring out what's happening at night. So maybe I'll go for that. Super. I have it set up to artificial only. Okay. Now when I come over and I say analyze, and I do the lighting analysis, I'm going to do a very slight variation. I'm still going to do this kind of lead calculation. I want that. But I want to go through and do a slight variation. And that is up under this little gear. I want to turn on this notion of overriding the lighting scheme. Okay. 
If overriding the lighting scheme is turned on, what's going to happen is in the lead analysis, actually that's the way it would be for the lead analysis, so this was uh, reset a little bit different because the last thing I did in the class. You know, if overwrite the lighting scheme is turned on, that means the lighting scheme that we've just specified in the rendering view using the artificial lights won't be used. It's going to just use the lead analysis. If I go ahead and turn off override, that means that it won't override the lighting scheme to only use the lead parameters. It's going to use the lighting scheme that I set up in the lighting uh, analysis model view. So it'll use those rendering settings. And if I want to consider the daylighting, that's what I want to do. It's a little counterintuitive. You almost have to go backwards. But overriding the lighting scheme means use the settings that are sort of built into the analysis. Ignore the settings that you're choosing in rendering. If you turn that off, it won't do that, so it'll use the rendering settings. I think it kind of feels a little bit backwards, but that's the way it works. So if you choose that, and now you say go through and uh, do the analysis. Okay, This is now going to do analysis that's going to include um, if the d uh, daylighting, if, uh, what? Natural lighting was being considered, it'll consider the light coming through the windows and the skylights. If it's artificial only, or if sun's being considered, it'll do that. If it's artificial only, it'll only consider those lights that I placed on the ceiling. If it's both, it'll be a mixture of the two. But you'll get the same sort of lighting analysis plan. Again, currently this is the last version, so the values aren't there. But when we get down and recalculate, and then we pull down the lighting when that's done. Okay, we'll get the new improved values, and we'll be able to see either the color map or this dot with the values on it. Um, if I want to see the color map, again, what I do is change over from the annotation style to just the kind of plain style. Okay, but if you want to see those values, switch it over to the points with the annotations. Okay, you get those. Okay. And that's where we left it today in class. So uh, thank you for bearing with me in this re-recording of the second part of class. We'll get this posted online. Um, hopefully we're all caught up with what's going on in class. So the things for folks in class to be working on are really um, both in the exercise, kind of work with that little sample building in terms of thinking about how you might uh, start playing with the lighting and the window conditions to go ahead and get daylighting uh, into the center of the building as well as some of the thermal properties of the walls. In general, for the whole integrated design project, just be thinking about how you're moving from a lot of bubble diagrams and organizational charts about how it might be laid out into a real Revit model that has walls and windows and floors to it so we can start doing this type of analysis and really figure out how that can start uh, influencing how you think about designing your facade. Okay, so let us adjourn for today, and I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Okay, thank you.